Come unto me, all ye that travail and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We read this in Matthew's Gospel this morning to find comfort and peace and hope and some direction in these, these crazy times that we're in. Good morning, everyone. This is the fifth Sunday of Lent, commonly called Passion Sunday. Uh, we'll be reading from our Book of Common Prayer, the 1928 Book of Common Prayer. Our readings and collect, our epistle, our gospel, begin on pages 132 through 133. And the bidding prayer that we'll read later on will be on page 47. And once again, welcome to an abridged version of St. Andrew's uh, prayer service. Uh, this is the best we can do at this point. We're trying different formats in order to bring you uh, Sunday service from St. Andrew's. Uh, we're trying to remember to keep, keep holy the, the Lord's Day, and uh, that's what we're doing here. And so let us pray. O most mighty and merciful God, in this time of grievous sickness, we flee unto thee for succor. Deliver us, we beseech thee, from our peril. Give strength and skill to all those who minister to the sick. Prosper the means made us for their cure. And grant that, perceiving how frail and uncertain our life is, we may apply our hearts unto that heavenly wisdom which leadeth to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our epistle reading this morning is written in the ninth chapter of Hebrews, beginning at the eleventh verse. Christ being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats or cows, but by his own blood he entered in once into a holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us, for of the blood of bulls and of goats, and the ashes of heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, that which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Our Gospel this morning, appointed for this fifth Sunday in Lent, Passion Sunday, according to St. John. Jesus said, Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Then answered the Jews, and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan, and hast a devil? Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and ye do dishonor me, and I seek not mine own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. Verily, verily I say unto you, If a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets. And thou sayest, If a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead, who makest thou thyself? Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him, and keeping his saying, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it, and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and thou hast seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Then took they up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord. Let us join together in this bidding prayer as we beseech God's goodness and mercy upon us. Good Christian people, I bid your prayers for Christ's holy Catholic Church, the blessed company of all faithful people, that it may please God to confirm and strengthen it in purity of faith, in holiness of life, and in perfectness of love, and to restore to it the witness of visible unity, and more especially for that branch of the same planted by God in this land, where we are members, that in all things it may work according to God's will, serve Him faithfully, and worship Him acceptably. You shall pray for the President of these United States, and for the Governor of this Commonwealth, and for all that are in authority, that all and every one of them may serve truly in their several callings to the glory of God, 
and the edifying and well-governing of the people, remembering the account that they shall be called upon to give at the last great day. He shall also pray for the ministers of God's holy word and sacraments for Bishop, especially Bishop Robert, that they may minister faithfully and wisely the discipline of Christ, likewise for all priests and deacons, that they may shine as lights in the world and in all things may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. And ye shall pray for due supply of persons fitted to serve God in the ministry and in the state, and to that end, as well as for the good education of all the youth of this land, ye shall pray for all schools, colleges, and seminaries of sound and godly learning, and for all whose hands are open for the maintenance, that whatsoever tends to the advancement of true religion and useful learning may forever flourish and abound. Ye shall pray for all the people of these United States, that they may live in true faith and fear of God, and in brotherly charity one towards another. Ye shall pray also for all who travel by land, sea, or air, for all prisoners and captives, for all who are in sickness or in sorrow, for all who have fallen into grievous sin, for all who through temptation, ignorance, helplessness, grief, trouble, dread, or the near approach of death especially need our prayers, and let us pause to remember those in our personal petitions. He shall praise God for rain and sunshine, for the fruits of the earth, for the products of all honest industry, and for all his good gifts, temporal and spiritual, to us and to all men. And finally, he shall yield unto God most high praise and hearty thanks for the wonderful grace and virtue declared in all his saints, who have been the choice vessels of his grace and the lights of the world in the several generations, and pray unto God that we may have grace to direct our lives after their good examples, that, this life ended, we may be made partakers with them of the glorious resurrection and the life everlasting. And Heavenly Father, we remember those who have called to your heavenly kingdom in heart and soul. We beseech thee to embrace them in the everlasting love. And Lord, we beseech thee to protect and defend our troops deployed here at home and around the world. Lord, we pray for the families and loved ones who await their return. Heavenly Father, we pray that you strengthen and comfort those who suffer both emotionally and physically the scars of war. And Lord, we remember those who paid the ultimate sacrifice for the liberties and freedoms we enjoy this very day. And Heavenly Father, we pray for a just end to war. And now, brethren, summing up all our petitions and all our thanksgivings and the words which Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And now just a few words about our gospel this morning and how it relates not only to the biblical times, but to our days that we're suffering currently. Take my lips, O Lord, and speak through them. Take our minds, O Lord, and enlighten them. Take our hearts, O Lord, and set them aflame. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. My folks, let me present you with a conundrum this morning. One truth that we have observed over these past several days is that how you look at something will determine what you see, what is actually reality for you. The second truth is that that reality shapes your perceptions. And that is what is around you and what happens to you determines to a very large extent what you observe or how you observe it. The conundrum or the puzzle which the truth is most, which truth is most persuasive in your life? Is it the reality or is it the perception? First we observe that who we are and what our biases and values are can certainly shape what and how we perceive things. A situation may be seen as a failure or an opportunity. A helping hand may be perceived as a kind thing or as patronizing, as a, as a leg up or as an attempt to weaken and belittle someone. How often does it happen that some, something we think is so good is described by someone else as being a bad thing? It happens all too frequently. How are we currently interpreting and responding to a coronavirus uh, pandemic? What is our perception in the midst of this crisis? Without giving into panic or complacency, we need to clearly acknowledge the scope and seriousness of the pandemic. 
We need to turn off the misinformation and the partisan responses and to pay attention to what local officials are saying and act accordingly. Our perception of things, not the things we see and hear, but the things we want to see and hear, shapes and defines who we are. It also shows us how we respond to the circumstances around us. The world with all its disease and brokenness should not be the filter through which we perceive the issues as they swirl around us. No, our perception must always be through the filter of truth, that is through the truth of Holy Scripture. And through all of this we must remember God is still sovereign, as he has been through all, all the ages, through plague and pestilence, natural calamities and man-made war. The opening words of Psalm 46 are as true now as they've ever been. God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble. Our text that we read this morning, John 8, 46, is another example of the problem of perception. It is also a deeper mystery which amazes us and gives us cause to praise God and finally asks us to a question to ourselves. And the question that, that is our theme this morning is, what do you hear? We read, he who is of God hears the words of God. So here is the conundrum presented to us. Who are you? The reality shapes what you can perceive, and that should be the word of God. Everyone who was listening to Jesus and John's gospel was hearing the same words. Yet they were not all believing what Jesus said. In other words, they were not perceiving what they heard to be the word of God, nor hearing it in the sense that they believed it and understood the truth of his words. Jesus said that the reason they could not perceive that it was the word of God was the reality of who they were, or more precisely, who they were not. They were not of God. And before our text earlier in John chapter 8, Jesus preached that unless they came to know him and trust in him, they would die in their sins. He explained that he was the Savior, the Messiah who prophesied. Then he said, if you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It was that passage which caused them to rebel. They said they, they were Abraham's children, and that they had, they had never been enslaved. How dare he say such a thing? And Jesus explained that he was talking about sin, and being a slave to sin. He told them that he knew the evil that was in their hearts, their desire, their very desire to kill him, and that they were doing the will of their father meaning Satan. Very much the same way many of us are dwelling on the noise and the, and the despair that is being preached about COVID-19. We are hearing and believing what we want to hear rather than the truth by authoritative sources. Likewise, back then they challenged Jesus, the one true authoritative source, and he responded with the truth of who he was and who they were. And finally came to the words which form our text today. And Jesus explained that because they did not believe in God or know him, they could not believe what he, Jesus, said. Their reality as unbelievers and therefore servants of the devil made it impossible for them to understand correctly or believe the word of God. Their reality informed, molded their perception, and their perception changed the nature of the reality of what they were hearing from the precious and life-giving word of God to something very confusing and obnoxious and something unbelievable. Does this all sound familiar these days? No one who is not of God can hear, that is properly understand or believe, the Word of God. And Jesus demonstrates that in our Gospel this morning, and he teaches it in very clear words. So obviously no unbeliever can hear or properly understand or believe the Word of God, either the Law or the Gospel. The question our text raises for us this morning is, what, what are you hearing? When God's word is preached, what do you hear? He that is of God hears God's word. It was true back then, so it is today. It is often difficult to listen to many times, and sometimes very uncomfortable to believe. Sure, we're happy to hear good things, which is why every television evangelist rips the promise of God out of its context and weighs them about to impress the crowd. They tell the people what they want to hear, instead of telling them what they need to hear, the truth, the truth of the gospel. And when they hear the truth, they oftentimes strongly reject it. Oddly, people generally don't mind the law, the law, those lists of do's and don'ts, so much as the gospel. 
the promises of God are disconnected from the context in which they are spoken, and they're severed from the context of faith and salvation. And so many of these TV preachers, to sound like God, wants everyone else to be rich, or God is going to make everyone eternally blessed without regard to their life or their relationship to God. The people who preach these things do not hear the word of God either, and so they preach the doctrines of distractions designed to lead the flock astray. The crowd that listens and raises their swaying hands at these distortions of God's word are denied the truth and find their satisfaction in the false teachings of their preachers, ultimately to their own destruction. You, however, as one of God's children, you know better. You have heard the truth, and sometimes the law is hard to listen to, and it can be convicting, but it's still the word of God. The Jews that Jesus spoke to could not listen to the law either. They wanted the law, something they could keep, that list of do's and don'ts, a checklist, if you will. They wanted the honor and the respect of being the chosen people, the children of Abraham, and they would reject anything, including the gospel, that denied them the respect and glory that they felt that they deserved. Their personal feelings preempted true faith. We sometimes, amid the, amid the law, we find that also very restricting, and we discover that it does not fit into our lives. It demands too much from us. It seems, to want, it seems to want our time and our talent and our treasure. And then we're supposed to feel all guilty and ashamed. And that is just not comfortable with us. And so we reject it. But the obvious truth, the sad truth is that we spend our time and our talent and treasure on ourselves far more freely than we spend it on the Word of God. We take our time and our trips and our sports and our entertainments far more seriously and sometimes far more frequently than we take worship or fellowship with the saints around word and sacrament. And so where are those sports and entertainments today in our struggles? Our time and our energy are focused many times on ourselves much more religiously than on our faith or on the work which God has set before us as an individual member of his body to which we belong. This current crisis is an opportunity, a second chance, if you will, to realign our priorities and reset those things in our lives that truly matter. Our angst today in the midst of this pandemic, for some, arises from the real risk of contracting the disease. For others, the loss of a job and potential loss of income. But for many, our agitation and our apprehension derives merely from being inconvenienced in the routine of our daily lives. No coffee with friends. No opening game, no shopping. And when I say those sorts of things, it is upsetting, or at least really uncomfortable for many to hear. So when that happens, when Jesus is speaking to you, especially in times like these, what are you hearing? Are you hearing the word of God? How is your reality shaping your perceptions? How are your perceptions shaping the reality around you? Oftentimes we feel guilty, we feel ashamed, we are prodded by God's law into self-examination. And if we dare to look that deeply, there in our darkness we will find failure and doubt and selfishness, pride. Quite simply, my friends, what we find is sin. And I know that because when I hear those same words, I too am accused, and I too must wrestle with my own sins and my own selfishness and my lukewarm devotions and prayers. But I also hear the gospel, and you should too. Jesus knows my heart and how I cannot turn away from my sins because I am a slave of sin in my flesh. And he has redeemed me. And he has also redeemed you. He traded his holiness and righteousness for our sins, yours and mine, and took the judgment of God against us on his shoulders. He bore the sentence of the wrath of God against us on the cross. He who was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the whipping that wins peace for us was laid upon his back, and with his stripes we are healed. He was made sin for us, he who knew no sin of his own, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We read that in Isaiah. You see, my fellow redeemed, his death on the cross was actually ours, taken for us. And we have been given his righteousness and holiness and the love of God which he has merited, and the everlasting life which he has earned is now ours by his gift. Are you a sinner? Not in him you're not. 
Should you feel guilty and ashamed? Not if you believe that in Jesus Christ you are cleansed and redeemed and forgiven and beloved of God. My friends, he has declared you not guilty. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. Those words are the gospel. Those words are God's words. Again, I ask, what are you hearing? The gospel is forgiveness in life, but only for sinners. People who don't think they need to be saved will not seek a savior. People who cannot hear the law, that word of God, cannot hear the gospel rightly either. They hear the words, they just don't receive them as God's words. And why is that? Well, he who is of God hears the words of God, and for this reason you do not hear them. Can it be said that very thing about us? Can we not find our comfort in Christ because we are not of God? I pray that this is not the case. We should never feel really pleased about who we are, separated, apart from Christ, or how we handle the things on our own wisdom and power, especially today. In the midst of a world gone mad, we should seek that peace that is found only in Jesus Christ, who has reconciled us with the Father and redeemed us from our sins and counts us as perfectly holy with his own righteousness. The things of this, of this daily life, as we now are witnessing, they will always fall short of right and good, and they will ultimately wither away. Our sinful flesh and the world and the devil will certainly see to that. It doesn't mean that we don't try to be the salt and the light. It does mean, however, we know the truth, and we know the source of that salt and light, and we try and we try again. But our hope is built on Jesus Christ, and his perfect righteousness, and his atoning, propitiatory, redemptive death on our behalf. And ultimately, as we make preparations this Lenten season, it is built upon his victorious resurrection. And so, my fellow redeemed, I ask again, what are you hearing? As a child of God, it should be life and peace and forgiveness and joy. It is the word of God, as intended for your ears and your hearts and your consciences. To doubt either the law or the gospel is to call Jesus a liar. And I know that none of us would want to do that. So once again, we, I, as we seek assurance in these troublesome days, we are reminded of what Jesus said in our gospel this morning. Truly, truly I say to you, if anyone keeps my words, he shall never see death. And I ask again, so what are you hearing? And we pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. And let us pray. Grant, we beseech thee, Almighty God, that the words which we have heard this day with our outward ears may, through thy grace, be so grafted inwardly in our hearts that they may bring forth in us the fruit of good living to the honor and praise of thy name, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. My friends, thank you for being with us today. And remember, be safe, wash your hands, and keep the faith, for this too shall pass. Have a good day.